If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and Bud will remedy that condition. Seems like Joe Biden might be our next president. And I, I get that it's not final or certified or set in stone, but it seems to be the way things are trending. And I'm not saying it's legitimate or illegitimate. I'm not saying that it's good or bad. You have your opinion, I'm sure, so do I. But that's not my point. My, my point is that that's how things seem to be going. And my observation is that Christians around the country seem to be losing their minds about that. I'm not talking about our brothers and sisters who are frustrated or anxious or disappointed or angry or sad. I mean, because that makes sense. I'm talking about believers in Jesus Christ acting as if the world is coming to an end. Have you seen that? Just one example, <coughs> but it's one that really had an impact on me. Earlier this week, Steve Bannon, longtime alley, longtime advisor of our president, went on TV and he was speaking about Anthony Fauci and Christopher Ray, the FBI director. And he proposed, he suggested, well, what we need to do is just cut off their heads. The, the quote is, I'd put the heads on pikes. I'd put them at two corners of the White House fence as a warning to federal bureaucrats to either get with the program or you're gone. And, and that's not the shocking part to me. That, that's Because, I mean, if you know anything about Steve Bannon, that's just who he is. I don't think anything that he says or does is going to shock me at this point. The, no, the part that shocks me, and, and even more than that, the part that saddens me, is how many Christians I know. How many brothers and sisters serving in ministry I saw reposting that with two thumbs up, <laughs> liking that, commenting right on. Steve Bannon, if he doesn't see his name in headlines often enough, he'll say something shocking just to get the attention. But, but I'm talking about believers. Commenting, posting, reposting that proposal and, and other proposals of things that as Christ followers we simply do not get to do. And using language as, as believers in Jesus Christ and dwelt by his spirit, we do not get to use. Do you know someone like that? Have you been someone like that? Maybe, maybe you haven't liked or reposted anything, but you find yourself nodding along with the people who do. I'm not throwing stones. I can relate. I've said right on to a few things that were way off. But I'm hoping that all of us this morning might be willing to let Paul give us some insight into what's happening to let him suggest a reason why we all might be feeling a little bit like the sky is falling and someone needs to do something. I think Paul wants to help us out. We're in 1 Corinthians 4, and Paul's already had some pretty strong words for his readers. He's writing to the church in Corinth, and this morning we're going to pick up in verse 6. He's going to have more strong words. But it's actually not where I want to start today. I want to begin at the end. I want to skip down to verse 14. We'll come back. But I want to begin with what Paul says at the end of this section. Not just at the end of the chapter, but at the end of this first thought that he's been sharing over the first several chapters about division in the church. Because I think it might be helpful to hear first what Paul says last. And what he says last is I'm not telling you these things because I want to hurt you. Paul has a way of getting to the end of, of a section, of a theme, and then offers a little bit of commentary on it. He'll pause and he'll say, okay, everything that I just said, here's, here's what I want to emphasize about it. Well, he's doing that here at the bottom of chapter 4. He, he gets to, to the end of these first four chapters and he says, I'm not telling you these things, Corinth, because I want to hurt you. I'm telling you these things because I love you. He wants them to understand. This is faithful are the wounds of a friend territory. 
This is, this is sometimes you've got to be cruel to be kind if you prefer the Nick Lowe translation. Paul's going to end there. I want to start there because, because I want you to know my heart as well as Paul's heart before we get into our text this morning. I, I want to underline the way that Paul's going to underline that my heart is the same as his heart, and I want to at least try to express that to you. Before you get into the pas passage and potentially draw the wrong conclusion about where I'm coming from. I hope that makes sense. Verse 14, Paul says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. Paul's going to have some hard things to say this morning, which means that I'm going to have some hard things to say because I'm the guy who's teaching the passage. But what he just said is that his goal and, and my goal his heart and, and my heart is not to condemn anyone, isn't to say anyone, look at yourself. I don't know how God can stand you. You're an embarrassment to the cross. That's not God's heart. That's never God's heart. Because God's a father and that's not a father's heart. So it can't be the heart of anyone claiming to represent the father, which is how Paul saw himself, which is how I try to see myself. Verse 15, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I've begotten you through the gospel. Paul had a special relationship with the Corinthians. He planted that church. A year, maybe two years before he wrote this letter, he planted that church among people that he himself led to Christ with leaders that he personally discipled. He was their spiritual father. And so he's saying to them, we're special to each other. A lot of people can teach you, but not everyone has our relationship. Not everyone is going to love you, at least not the way that I love you. The word instructor here in verse 15 is pedagogue. And it's not a it's not a one to one correlation, but if you think nanny, if you think housekeeper, if you think Alice on the Brady Bunch, you're probably a little closer than what comes to mind when you say instructor. Literally, it was someone who would walk a student to school. And so Paul is saying, hey, lots of people can get you to school safely. Lots of people can pick you up from school and feed you juice and graham crackers. But not everyone is going to challenge you to grow up. Not everyone is going to love you enough to challenge you to, to take steps into maturity. But I'm going to, because I'm your spiritual dad, and that's what dads do. I don't have the same relationship with this church, obviously. I, this, the relationship that Paul had with the Corinthian church, I didn't plant this church. I didn't lead most of you to Christ. I've, I've discipled some of you, not all of you. But I love you, and I pray for you, and I'm called to shepherd you, and that's what makes me different than the other 10,000 instructors that you could be listening to right now on the internet. You're here, not somewhere else. You're watching this service online and not some other service because you think that God has called you to this family. And if that's true, then he wants to speak to you about things specific to this church. 10,000 instructors on the internet, most of whom are way more skilled than me, far more knowledgeable, much more articulate, and let's be honest, a lot funnier. <laughs> but I don't know of any that are praying for you specifically this morning. I don't know of any that were praying for you by name yesterday or throughout the week. I don't know of any who are asking, Lord, what do you want to say specifically to Calvary Chapel, Wichita this weekend? There's so much in God's word that we can talk about, but Lord, what is it that you know that we need to see and hear and live out? Of all the things we could spend time on, what are the right things for us? What are the now things? What are, what are the we things? Verse 16, Paul says, imitate me. That's what I'm trying to do. 
That's what I try to do every week. And on any given Sunday, in any given passage, lots of stuff we could talk about. All kinds of depths that we could plumb. All kinds of interesting trails that we could follow. Treasures that we could dig up and unearth. And to be honest, it's easy to do that. That's, that's the, that's, that's, it's easy. Being a tour guide, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Coming up on our left, we see birds, and a symbol of birds in Scripture always points to evil. Alfred Hitchcock got that right. It's easy to be a tour guide. Talk about things that I find interesting. The greater challenge, the challenge that Paul undertook, and the challenge that he's passed on to guys like me, is to not just tour the Word, or even teach the Word, but to love people in the room, love the people tuning in online, through the word. To not just talk about things that are true, because lots, uh, lots of things are true. But to listen to God's voice and to share the things that God underlines through God's spirit passionately, compassionately. God's truth for this group on this day. So what is that? What does God have for us? Well, I, I think part of it is, is what we just talked about. I think the other part of it begins at verse 6. Paul's going to transition here. He's going he's to come out of what he's been talking about and he's going to embark on sort of a summary, a consolidation. He starts by reaching back. He says, these things, brethren, the things that I've been talking about, understand, I've figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes. Why? That you might learn in us not to think beyond what is written, what is written in God's word that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. He begins by saying, let's remember where we've been. We've been talking about division in the church, the tendency in the Corinthian church to say, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. And Paul has used that as a catchphrase. That's been his way of pointing at division and divisiveness for a couple chapters now. He's used that phrase several times. Verse 6, he continues by saying, you understand I'm just using that as an example, right? I'm talking about me and Apollos because we're friends and I can use him as an example and I can use myself as examples, but that's what I'm doing because we're not the only names that, that you're organizing yourself under. You know and I know that, that, that the Paul team and the Apollos team aren't the only divisions in the church. They're not the only distinctions that you're making. You've come up with all kinds of ways to point at each other and say to each other, well, I'm better than you are, we're better than they are. And every time you do, this is now Paul moving forward, every time you do that, still verse 6, you're going beyond what's written in the Word. You're going outside the boundaries of God's instruction to us. Because what is it that we read in the Word that's supposed to define us? Well, a lot of things. Love, joy, peace, patience, the fruit of the Spirit is, is intended to define us. If we're indwelt by God the Holy Spirit, it should define us. But related to that, what Paul is talking about here is humility. Humility is supposed to define us as Christ followers. And that's not unrelated to love. Love is about prioritizing others, right? Choosing others. Humility is about not prioritizing self, not choosing self, not overestimating self. For who makes you differ from another, verse 7? I like the NASB translation. Who regards you as superior to another? Who told you you were better than anyone else? And why in the world did you believe them? Now you've gone out of bounds, Paul is saying. You're out of bounds. You're outside of the, the, the guidelines he gave us in his word. And Paul knows that they know that. He's not telling them anything new. Because he talks throughout this letter about the false humility that's abundant in the Corinthian church. They know humility is the right answer. How do they know? Because they're so quick to pray, Lord, give us humility. Lord, keep us humble. The thing is, is that real humility has no need to pray like that. Because real humility looks in the mirror and asks, what do I have to be proud of? 
pastor friend of mine, older brother in the Lord, told me a story years ago about planting a church, and the church struggled for a number of years. We were back doing our Saturday evening service. We had about 10 or 12 people, I think, last night. And that was the size of his church for several years. And, and in frustration, he went to Romaine, one of Pastor Chuck's early assistants back at Calvary Costa Mesa. And he said, Romaine, why don't people want to hear me teach? Romaine's answer was, because that's the question that you're asking. You're asking, why don't people want to hear me as if you have something to offer them? What you should be asking is, why are 10 people showing up to hear you? What do you have to give? Who told you that you had anything to offer? Verse 7, Paul's question, what do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that God didn't give you? Answer, nothing. This election has me thinking about past elections. I was thinking about the 2012 election when President Obama was running for re-election. He said in a campaign speech, you probably remember this, because it was a phrase that, that his opponents seized upon and, and, and used as a rallying cry. President Obama said in 2012 to business owners, you didn't build that. You remember that line? There was a tremendous, immediate and tremendous backlash. And, 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 some of it was unfair because what he was trying to say was nothing that isn't true. No man is an island. And he had a point. I mean, a, a, a company that I used to work closely with built a manufacturing plant in Topeka several years ago. And the reason they chose Topeka out of every place that they could have in the, in the continental United States is because the state of Kansas offered them huge tax incentives to move there. And the city of Topeka paid for roads and utilities to go out to the parcel of real estate that they purchased. They didn't, they didn't buy an existing facility. They started with a green field and they built one. But Topeka said, if you build here, we'll pay for the roads, we'll pay for the plumbing, we'll pay for the gas, we'll pay for the electric. And I don't know if it was a state or a city thing or a combination of things, but they also offered tremendous financial incentives for people to move there and work there. Cash incentives? interest-free home loans for anyone who would move there and commit to working there. And, 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 and you know, the, the business side was, well, but we pay taxes and we pay workers and we invest in our brands and we develop products that people want. We don't take from the community, we give to the community. And so the argument raged on. And I was sympathetic to the business owner because I've been one, and every business owner sees themselves as the embodiment of the American dream. I remember thinking, and I remember saying, I built this company with my two hands, and I held it together with tears and sweat and gallons of caffeine. It's mine. Well, some of the Corinthians were feeling the same way. And they were saying the same thing about their church, not about their business, but about their place of worship and about their ministries. We built this. We bled for this. We work for this. It's ours. And Paul's answer is, no, it's not. You didn't build that. You were given that. And what Paul wants to know is why in the world they're confused about that when Scripture says every good and perfect gift comes from above. John the Baptist in John 3, 27, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Why are you confused, Paul is wondering. Didn't I tell you that everything we have, gifting, talent, inspiration, church, freedom to have church, country in which God has placed our church. They're given by God. And they're given by God with a purpose. One purpose, to make his name famous. Every good thing is from above. It's from him and it's for him, to glorify him. Paul's saying to the Corinthians, guys, you didn't build that. 
And you can sit around and tell each other that you did. You can sit around and pat each other on the back for what a great job you did. Oh, we couldn't have done it without you. You're just the most gifted evangelist. Me, well, you're the teacher. You're the expositor of God's word. Oh, but the one who sets the table for the teaching of God's word is this fantastic worship leader. You're really quite something. Oh, but, I, you know, I, I have to say that the counselors, the elders are the glue that holds the church together. But, but together, all of us, yes, we have, in fact, built quite a church. Paul's response, all right, then what do you need me for? Why did I come? Why was I there? Why am I writing to you? For that matter, verse 8, what do you need God for? It sounds like you have everything figured out. You're already full. You're already rich. You've reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish that you did reign, that we also might reign with you. Paul's indulging in a little sanctified sarcasm here. He's saying, you're so rich in spiritual gifts. You're so wise in spiritual knowledge you're pretty convinced you're ready to start ruling and reigning with Christ today. They're like the Laodiceans, if you think about it. They weren't hungering or thirsting for righteousness. Why? They thought they already had it. You don't drink if you're, or if you're not thirsty. You don't eat if you're not hungry. They weren't hungering and thirsting for righteousness. They were fine. Just ask them. A few years ago, I took some of the guys through a book called Dangerous Calling. It's a book by Paul Tripp about the dangers of ministry. And one of the dangers that he talks about, he calls the danger of arrival. When you get to the point after serving the Lord for a while that you no longer look at this life, you no longer look at ministry as a journey, you decide you're already there. And you don't need the accountability that, that comes from the body of Christ. You don't need God's, mirror to hold, uh, God's word to hold up a mirror to your life. You don't need God's grace because you don't make any mistakes anymore. God's work in you is complete. You've arrived. Paul says to the Corinthians, you know, I really wish that was true. I wish that you had arrived. I wish you had all the answers, because if you had all the answers, then I'd have all the answers, and we could sit around together having all the answers and rule and reign together. That would be awesome. Except here's the thing Paul's telling them. You haven't arrived. And the way that I know that you haven't arrived is that in this life we never arrive. This life is a life of becoming. This life isn't about reigning, it's about training this life is schooling it's preparation to rule and reign with christ question what prepares us to rule and reign with christ answer having fellowship with christ in his rejection we don't get to skip that step paul is saying jesus didn't skip that step if Jesus didn't skip that step, how do we get to skip that step? It would be disloyal, it would be ungrateful, it would be, be wrong on so many levels to think that we would, would get to, to skip over that and start ruling and reigning, to, to, to claim a crown before Jesus gets his. That's not the example I set for you, Paul continues. It's not the example I set for you when I was with you. It's not the example I'm setting for you today. It's not the example that you see in any of the apostles. Verse 9, I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last. We're called to the lowest place, not the highest place. We're men condemned to death, for we've been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Paul reinforcing what Peter says about how the lives that we live, the lives of grace that God has given us, are teaching not only the world, but angels about the grace of God, the love of God. But that's not Paul's main point here. Paul, still indulging in a bit of sarcasm, is, is saying, I wish I could be as important as you think you are. I wish I could sit in high places like you. I, it would be great to be invited to the owner's box, the, the sky box up in the Colosseum with the, the shag carpet and the cold drinks. But the thing is, I'm going to be down on the floor of the arena with the other apostles fighting lions and hyenas and rabid dogs. Because that's what we're called to in this life. One day, 
Paul understands. One day he'll sit on a throne. He knows that because Jesus said that. Jesus said, when the Son of Man sits on a throne of glory, Matthew 19, then you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones and you'll judge the 12 tribes of Israel. One day. But Paul knows that that day isn't this day. He knows that that age isn't even this age. That age is the kingdom age. That kingdom come, it's not here yet. This is the church age. This is the age of grace. It's not the age of the conquering king. It's the age of the sword. Puts us... you and I would say, puts us in the crosshairs. Because in the eyes of the world, a life of service to the Lord makes us very, very dangerous. A life that we live surrendered to Jesus makes us dangerous people to the, because the cross is a dangerous idea. We're dangerous to this world because the world is dark and we're threatening to bring in light. Darkness despises light so darkness comes against us comes against us with every tool in its arsenal poverty and persecution ridicule and reproach contempt and condemnation and the right response to all of that paul says verse 10 the apostles response to the opposition that they're experiencing is to welcome it the right response paul says bring it on because when paul got saved on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, when Paul got saved, he prayed what? Lord, what do you want me to do? And when Paul prayed it, he meant it, and he's telling the Corinthians, the other apostles meant it too. But he's saying to them, I'm not sure that you guys ever did. We, me, Peter, John, James, we're fools for Christ's sake. But you think you're so wise in Christ. We know that we're weak, but you're convinced that you're so strong. You're distinguished. At least that's what you say. But we're dishonored, and that's what we know. Understand, Paul's whole career had been laid out for him. He was a made guy. He was a student of Gamaliel. As a young man, he was already a member of the Sanhedrin. Top 70 leaders in Israel. He was already influential and becoming more influential with every passing day. And he threw it all away. In the eyes of the world, at best, Paul had thrown away a, 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 a life of worth and reputation for a worthless life built on an empty, worthless idea. That was at best. At worst, Paul was living a disruptive life based on a dangerous idea. And Paul says, yeah, and I would do it again. That was a good trade. Meanwhile, Corinthians, what are you guys doing? You're congratulating yourself on how much influence you have on the world, how much respect you have from the world, how esteemed you are by the world. Paul says, yeah, that's not how apostles do it. That's not the example we're setting for you. That's not the road that you should be on. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. And we're poorly clothed, beaten, homeless. We don't have supporters enabling us to live a life of luxury. We labor, verse 12. We work with our hands. That's a dig at the Corinthians because in their minds, the, a life of wisdom, if the Bible was a book of wisdom, then they should be the wisest of all and Wisdom to them meant, meant free from manual labor. That was, that was for other people. We do it, Paul says. We labor, the Greek says we labor to the point of exhaustion. We do it every day because we don't have a choice. But you know what? We don't resent it. And we don't blame anyone for it. And we don't attack anyone or threaten anyone because of it. Being reviled, we bless. 
We don't return evil for evil. We, we, we receive the evil and we give back good. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We've been made as the filth of the world, the off-scouring of all things. We're, we're the black stuff that you scrape off the bottom of your pan. And we keep going with joy. Because that's what Jesus told us to expect. And that's how Jesus told us to respond with love. Turn the other cheek. Man takes your coat, give him your cloak. Man says, walk a, while with, uh, walk a mile with me, walk three. Love your enemies. <clears throat> What about us? You knew that's where this was going to go, right? Because I basically telegraphed it at the beginning, and even if I didn't, that there's the point in every study where you say, that's the Corinthians, and that's what Paul said to the Corinthians, but to what extent is that us? And to what extent is he talking to us? And there's a lot of ways we could answer that. There's a lot of applications we could draw from this short passage. But I think that there's one that the Lord has for us today. The, the thing that, that I think the Lord would have us notice in this passage is how well it explains why so many evangelicals over the last 72 hours seem to have lost their minds. <clears throat> and, and, and before I keep going... Let me make sure that, I, that, that, that you're not hearing what I'm not saying. I'm not talking about people who are saying we should count every legal vote and disallow every illegal vote. That makes sense. That's rational. I'm not talking about people who are saying, hey, maybe we should call a timeout and, and not rush this whole coronation that began yesterday. Maybe we should take a beat and investigate the serious allegations of fraud being made. That seems rational, too. <clears throat> I'm talking about conversations where people are saying, Jesus put Donald Trump in the White House. We need to start shooting people who would remove him from the White House and put their heads on spikes on the fence outside the White House in Jesus' name. Because Jesus said, I come not to bring peace but a sword. It's sword time. There's people saying it. There's people thinking it. But that's Corinthian thinking. It's taken to an extreme, but it's coming from the exact same place. And it's the exact same attitude Paul's been talking about. It's the heart that Paul's been warning us about. The heart that says, look at what we've accomplished. Look at what we've created. Look at what we've achieved. We made it. We built it. It's ours. And anyone who threatens to take it away is the enemy. No, Paul is saying. No, you didn't build that. No, you didn't achieve anything. And if you have anything, it's because God gave it to you, but you've forgotten that. You've convinced yourself that you did this or that you did that. So now you're convinced that it's up to you to defend that. He's talking to the Corinthians about their church, about their ministry, their theology, but I think he's speaking to us this morning about our ideology. Because all through this election, evangelicals have been saying to each other, look what we've done. We put an ally in the White House and look what we've done together. We turned back the tide of moral degradation in this country. We've protected religious freedom. We've put three conservative justices on the court. We've set the stage to undo Roe. Look at what we've done. Look at what we've done. We sound like the Corinthians. Because we are like the Corinthians a little bit. With an ally in the White House for the last four years. Yeah, in a sense, we've been reigning. We've been walking the halls of power, shaping discussions. We've seen accomplishments. We've had influence. And we've received recognition. And along the way, we started telling ourselves, we worked hard for all of that. We spent too many years without it. We deserve it. We deserve power and influence. And now that we have it, we are so scared that we might lose it. 
We're scared of losing our seat at the table. We're scared that we might be on the outside looking in again. We're scared that following Christ might mean that we're uncomfortable, that our faith might come with a real cost, and scared people are capable of crazy things. Scared people say crazy things. They threaten crazy things. They go out and do nutso stuff if they think that it might keep them from losing whatever it is that they hold most dear. What do we hold most dear? What are we trying to hold on to? Is it Jesus? Or is it power and influence in the world that Jesus has given us for a season? Because Paul just reminded us, our time for glory, honor, and power has not yet come. This life isn't about reigning, it's about training. It's about humility. We're not here, Paul's been telling us this morning, we're not here to get a head start on the second coming. We're not here to start ruling and reigning so that when Jesus returns as a conquering king, he'll find that we've got things all set up for him. Hey, Jesus, we've been waiting for you. Here's your throne. Here's your kingdom. We've got it all set. We did this. That's not our calling. We're not here to get a head start on the second coming. We're here to finish the ministry that Jesus began 2,000 years ago with his first coming. When he came not as a conquering king, but as a suffering servant. That's the identity we need to be embracing, Paul says. We're here for one thing, to preach Christ and him crucified, which means, yeah, we're here to be pointed at, verse 9. We're here to be ridiculed, verse 10. Suffering is part of the gig, verse 11. And so is being treated like scum, verse 13. We are not here, family, to be respected. We're here to be rejected and despised. And we desperately want to believe it doesn't have to be that way. We keep telling ourselves there's a better way. Maybe there's a middle ground. Patrick, you're the both and guy. What if it was a little bit of biblical authority and a little bit of worldly influence? What if we took, you know, a little spiritual anointing, but also some strategic alliances? What's the problem with that? I mean, I mean, there's a lot of problems with that, but the big problem? It leaves us in control. It puts us on the throne. And as soon as we think we're in control even a little bit, as soon as we start believing we're the ones building any part of God's kingdom, we become the Corinthians. We start to take pride in our kingdom and find our identity in what we've built and we start defending our things instead of depending on God the Holy Spirit who wants to build his kingdom, which isn't a worldly kingdom, but a kingdom of souls saved out of this world. Imitate me, says Paul. You don't see me building my kingdom, I'm building his kingdom and imitate me because I'm not the general contractor. I'm a guy who wears a hard hat and carries a lunch bucket. Imitate me. I'm a servant. I'm a worker. And God doesn't always tell me what he's doing. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. And sometimes it seems like he's making it harder for me and other times he's making it easier for me. Sometimes he gives, sometimes he takes away. But when he does, when God takes away, I try not to feel robbed. I try to remind myself not to get angry. I tell myself it's not my place to get even. I count to 10 and I pray before I lash out. If God tears something down or takes something away, I choose to keep going. I choose to keep building, Paul says, because whatever God removed, whenever I wake up and find a tool missing from my toolbox, I realize I must be better off without it or I'd still have it. Imitate me, says Paul. If, if the election stands, it may or may not drag our nation down but it doesn't have to drag us down. We can decide not to let it drag us down. We can decide to keep building. We don't have to hang our heads in despair. Oh, God's judgment is upon us. It's really not. Because God tells us what his judgment is going to look like. This isn't it. 
We don't need to give up. We don't have to moan and groan that God's enemies have triumphed. They haven't. Imitate me, says Paul. Imitate me and consider the possibility that the outcome of this election is a blessing. God ordains leaders, Romans 13, 1. Imitate me, says Paul, and consider the possibility that God has allowed what he's allowed in this election to keep his people from being Corinthians. Consider the possibility that God has humbled us to bring us back to a point where he can use us. Imitate me, Paul says. If the election stands and the church goes back to being a spectacle, don't let it change what you're about. Serve. If the world starts calling you a fool, be a fool for Jesus. Embrace it. If it means suffering for him, you'll have fellowship with him. You'll understand Jesus better than you ever did. Welcome it. And if you're treated like scum, you know how to respond to it. When Jesus was the recipient of the greatest single injustice in the history of the universe, he responded with love. It's not our place to hate. Not our place to destroy. We're to be witnesses of Christ's love, not instruments of his vengeance. Imitate me, Paul says. Remember the battle belongs to the Lord. We're soldiers in that battle, not generals. We're workers in the field, not the field owner. We're builders in the kingdom, not the king. In time, he'll place us on thrones. Our time is coming, but it's coming with the second coming. It's not coming with this election or the next election or the election after that. It's coming with his glorious return. In the meantime, we trust. In the meantime, we pray. In the meantime, we build. We humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, 1 Peter 5, 6, that he may exalt us in due time, in his time. And until that time, we cast our cares on him because he's not constrained by who's in the White House. Cast your cares on him, Peter says, knowing he cares for us. Father, thank you for your love and thank you for the reminder that you give us everywhere we look in your word. Your love pours out of every page, out of every chapter. You tell us the volume of the book is written of Jesus. And Lord, thank you that you use your word to remind us that you've called us to be like Jesus. Humble, servants, taking the last place, esteeming others, surrendered, available, free. Lord, teach us to be like Jesus. Teach us Jesus. That the world might see him in us, come to know him through us as we labor in your fields, as we build your kingdom.